Hi, and welcome to the Engineered Mind podcast, a podcast about engineering, AI, neuroscience, and other interesting topics of life to educate and inspire people all around the world. I'm your host, Yusef, and for the third podcast, I'm very happy to have the team of Dark Arrow on the show. They are a team of three brothers, Keegan, River, and Riley Carl. They are engineering the fastest, longest range aircraft you can build in your garage. Their inspiration for the company in the Dark Arrow One grew out of years of visits to EAA AirVenture. Over those years, they were always looking for new kit aircraft attempting to push the limits of speed, range and efficiency by leveraging the latest tools, materials and technology. After a few years of quietly researching, testing and experimenting, they decided to leave their engineering jobs in July 2017 to pursue Dark Arrow full-time with the mission of creating the best kit aircraft. And now, ladies and gentlemen, have fun and happy learning with the team of Dark Arrow. Uh, thanks guys for joining and making time to to attend this podcast. What I would start is just a chilled out introduction. Maybe the youngest one starts and then we'll move up in terms of age. Sure. Yeah, so I guess I'm the youngest one here. I'm River. Um, so a little bit about my background. I went to school at UW-Madison, just like the rest of us here, uh, for electrical engineering. And my focus was on control systems and software development. I worked in industry in the local area for a uh, few years and then, um, you know, working for a couple of software companies, um, startups in town. And then, uh, yeah, we sort of started working on this in our spare time in 2014 and then went full time on it in 2017. And that's where I've been ever since kind of focusing on, um, you know, we all kind of play a role in different areas um, collectively, but um, my focus is on avionics and uh, just different uh, machinery that we've built around here, like our oven and thermoformer, uh, maintaining all that. So I'm Keegan, I'm the middle brother. Uh, my background is mechanical engineering. So a lot of the focus or my specialty with the project has been kind of design of the landing gear for the aircraft and then the uh, kind of the analysis of it and then also the machining of it and then the machining of the plugs and molds for our uh, for our aircraft. So that's been a big focus for, for me. You want to mention your work background a little? Oh yeah, so work background. So I graduated from university back in 2010, Wisconsin, um, UW-Madison. Um, after school, I went and worked for a company called Cummins. I was there for six years, and then I worked on uh, product development and product launch at the at the company. So that's kind of mm. my story in a background. <laughs> Quick nutshell. Awesome. I'm Riley, the older brother, oldest brother. Uh, my background is in aerospace engineering. Graduated University of Wisconsin Madison, 2008. And then after school, I worked for Caterpillar for three years uh, on large mining trucks. Uh, and then after that, I worked uh, for a company called Weir Minerals, uh, basically building industrial pumps and specifically focused on ceramic composite materials, uh, materials development. And then, yeah, got into starting Dark Arrow. And my area of focus on the project is aerodynamics and composites. Awesome. Great. So obviously, I think uh, most of the audience will be interested in because it takes a lot of guts to just say, okay, we quit our jobs and do something on our own. Uh, how was it for you also like the psychological aspect to really start something by yourself and give everything else up like in terms of job and so on? Oh, I mean, we've been thinking about doing it uh, for some time, going back as far as when we were all in school, uh, just sort of, I don't know, spitballing ideas off each other as far as like what we could go in together on. It was more like at that point, it was more just like sharing articles on different companies we admired and how they were doing it and how they were pulling off different things and then creating Google Docs, like listing ideas that we had and nothing that serious though. Um, but then as we all started getting into industry, I think we all kind of had our own mutual frust frustrations with our jobs and just wanted to have, um, I guess, more responsibility. And that was, mm -hmm. I'd say, a big driving factor uh, for each of us. And, uh, you know, although like something like uh, kit aircraft was not my forte, um, you know, 
given my background, I was really excited about the mission of the plane and what it could accomplish and what it would mean for kid aircraft if we were to pull it off. So that was, I guess, what motivated me. Um, and I don't know, we can all kind of speak to this in some way, but I think for, for each of us, you know, we're, we're all still young and single. Um, I, I mean, in that sense, like just, we don't have families yet. Um, so it uh, was something where we could embark on it without having to burden um, someone else. It's, it's really something where if we failed, in a worst case scenario, it was just like we'd go back to doing what we were doing before. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it didn't really seem like a, uh, you know. Scary risk. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't as bad as people would who would come up to us and ask like, oh, how do you just quit your jobs? And Yeah, and I think that's an important part. It's not, it's not like a decision we just woke up one day and did. There was like years of planning that went into it. Um, and it was pretty, like three pretty solid years of, work uh in the in the background uh kind of laying the foundation and laying out a plan that we could execute on when we did uh go into it full time so um i think when the day came when it's like okay now we're, we're leaving our jobs and we're doing this full time it, it didn't feel as scary as i guess it could have because we had done all that planning it was still obviously um there's, there's a little bit of uncertainty uh, in anything you try. So there, there's still, yeah, that, that sense of fear because of that. But um, yeah, I, th I think that all that planning that went into it kind of made the fear less. Yeah, I see. Is it also what keeps you awake at night, this, this kind of fear? It's, it's just like, uh, you know, being kept awake at night is, is many things like, Wanting to succeed, really, I think is the big thing because there's so much time and effort and uh, money invested in it. And, uh, you know, we're excited about the whole project and we want to pull it off. So I, I think it's just a combination of like, yeah, not wanting to fail and wanting to succeed. That combined feeling, I think, would is what keeps me awake at night. Mm. So I want to talk to you about your, of course, your project, Dark Arrow 1, a little bit more. And uh, one of the questions I got is from Robert Helms, so the UL Power Guy. And would, would the audience, of course, would be interested in it. Why did you choose the UL 520 IS and um, why not any other engine? You would probably answer that best. Yeah, so uh, for people who don't know, Robert is the North American sales manager for our, our engine. And uh, over the years, we've developed a pretty good relationship with him. So uh, we're, we're kind of buddies with him. And so it's a funny question coming from him. But yeah, the... The reason we picked the engine we did, um, we're trying to achieve uh, a higher level of performance, speed and range with our kit aircraft than, is what, than what's traditionally available on the market. And so uh, we kind of knew we couldn't do the same thing that's been done. So we had to use a newer engine. So this engine we selected is relatively newer um, and it has a pretty good power to weight ratio. So it's very light and um, it's a modern engine. So it's incorporating all the newest technology that we have available for an aircraft engine. So it's computer controlled, uh, you know, fuel injected electronic ignition. Um, so it's uh, more modern and uh, it's easier to fly because of that. So it's much like your car, you get in your car, turn the key and you just have a gas pedal uh, and traditional aircraft engines aren't necessarily like that. You have to have a manual control on the fuel mixture. Some of them have carburetor heat that you control manually. Uh, so this one is easier to fly. There's less pilot workload. So um, yeah, performance and ease of use are the, the big reasons we picked it. Mm, that's great. I mean, if people want to look up the specs, you, they can obviously find them on a website. But uh... Yeah, just for those who are interested, it's a 5.2 liter engine, right? Six cylinder and 200 horsepower. Correct. Excellent. See, it's a true so, aircraft engine. So in the in the realm of uh, aviation, there's kind of a mix of engines you'll see in aircraft. Most popular is true aircraft engines, but you'll see people using uh, essentially automotive conversions. Where they'll take a car engine and put a gearbox on it and run a propeller. Uh, so this engine was specifically designed for aircraft, uh, which is another reason that we uh, wanted to use it uh, as opposed to trying some something uh, like an auto conversion. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Uh, going to the next term, you I saw on your homepage you have a term called hollow grid. 
how much uh, or can you explain what this term actually means? Like it's a bit of a fancy term, but maybe you co can go a little bit into depth. It's it's basically a short term to describe the the structure and manufacturing that we use to make um, the airframe of the aircraft. So the the wings, the tail, and some of the fuselage. And uh, what we do is we have a all the all the load or the aerodynamic loads in the aircraft are carried by the skin of the aircraft. So the skin is kind of like an exoskeleton, like you'd see in an insect maybe. And then mm -hmm. um, there's a a grid internally. Um, and that supports the skin against buckling. So it may, helps it maintain its shape. And so that's a little bit different than uh, what you see in other uh, aircraft. Uh, there are similar arrangements, but ours is a little bit unique. We use a uh, honeycomb sandwich panel with uh, carbon fiber on the skins and then a uh, honeycomb core. So we make these panels and then CNC cut a bunch of uh, ribs and uh, other shapes out of them, bulkheads that uh, we assemble with jigs and fixtures, and then we um, use that internal skeleton to support the skin of the aircraft. Um, so hollow grid is kind of the term that encapsulates all of that, the, the internal structure as well as the manufacturing process that we use to make that. Um, that was a good way to get it kind of boiled down into one word. Yeah, and one other thing to say about it is that there's a benefit from a customer's perspective because it does Uh, create this opportunity for more fuel storage and then it's a strong structure and it's really light but one thing that basically led us down that path was not so much from a customer perspective or a, like even say like a marketing perspective or anything like that it was more driven by a manufacturing need uh, we were looking for a way to simplify and reduce the amount of labor that's involved in constructing a composite kit aircraft uh, composites or working with composites is very labor intensive so any opportunity you can uh, take to design it in a way that reduces that amount of labor can help drive the cost down. Uh, so hollow grid is a is an approach or is in a way is it's a way to accomplish that because by making one large sheet of uh, honeycomb panel and doing that one time and then allowing a machine to cut out those ribs, it means you don't have to devote that effort into making those ribs uh, as like an individual. Putting that labor into each yeah you're essentially having a machine cut out the parts yeah. and then the other benefit with that is that uh you can quickly iterate or change that design if we decide that we come up with a way to optimize the internal structure more uh if there were molds those molds remain fixed and so you'd have to build a new mold if you wanted to change the internal ribs whereas with this approach uh we can change the number or the positioning or the arrangement of them uh, very easily Uh, just by updating the 3D model and then cutting out new ribs. Yeah, and just to kind of tack on to that, um, I guess we wouldn't necessarily call, well, I guess it's sort of an extension of the hollow grid is that we use those same bulkheads in our fuselage. Um, and so there's an area where I could see us iterating on, say, the cockpit design, where it's like more of an ergonomic thing that's more difficult to figure out until you're actually sitting in it and using the plane in a more routine basis where you decide later like, oh, well, this armrest doesn't feel right. Like, what if we changed the height on this or made it like sucked in a little bit? Um, if, if we were to suggest that change, especially for a small shop like us, it's uh, something that we probably wouldn't do because it would require building a whole new set of molds to create that part. But because uh, the bulkheads inside of our fuselage are manufactured using the same panel material, um, we can again just change the CNC cutout and then shape that differently uh, on the next pass. And without having to build any external tooling to create that change, we can, you know, um, you know, we can kind of listen to customer feedback and then quickly implement those changes, even with, yeah, like a small team like us. Mm, yeah, it makes absolute sense. Uh, one of you mentioned the f uh, fuel, that fuel is going into the wings. Let's, so we saw on Instagram that you started very young. So if someone is watching now and being inspired by you as a team and he doesn't or she doesn't uh, know that fuel is actually stored in the wings, can you maybe explain in like layman terms or simple terms what this means and how much fuel can you actually store in the wings? Yeah, the, the wing is hollow and th there's different approaches to where you store the fuel in an aircraft depending on what the aircraft is and what the mission is. And for ours, 
with it being high speed and long range, uh, part of what allows us to achieve a long range is we just have a very large fuel capacity. So the whole wing is hollow and um, it could be dead space, but if you can free that up and, and keep it hollow, you can put a lot of fuel in there. So we have 77 gallons of fuel capacity, uh, whereas like you think about an average car might have uh, like 12 or 15 gallons of fuel. So we have a lot of fuel and that's part of the, the secret sauce, I guess, to the long range. The fuel burn rate. Mm. Yeah, and then with, uh, with the engine that we're picking, it's a pretty efficient engine. So the fuel burn rate is relatively low. Um, so that's the other thing that feeds into uh, achieving that long range. And the, the other thing with storing your uh, fuel on the wing, uh, structurally it's an efficient approach because you have that weight distributed out over the wing and your wing is providing all the lifting load. So it's a, it's a good way to distribute it uh, to keep things structurally efficient as opposed to having it uh, in one big tank in the fuselage, that's more of a point load, which is not the best way for mm. structures. And normally your wing kind of sits where your CG does in the aircraft. So as you start eating up that fuel or consuming that fuel, you're not really changing the CG position of your aircraft. Center of gravity. Center of gravity, yes. Uh, so if you mm -hmm. try to position that fuel tank in the front or the back of the aircraft and you imagine that fuel being depleted as it's being burned, you're now changing the, the way that the aircraft is balanced overall. But if you keep it in the wings, as you consume that fuel, you're not really changing the center of gravity of that yeah. aircraft. Which, and, that, and that's really critical on aircraft, keeping the center of gravity in the correct position. Uh, it's important for stability and control. If you get it too tail yeah. heavy or too na nose heavy, it can um, affect the flight characteristics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. Also, um, how do you distribute the fuel? Because uh, as far as I know, the classical approach is like having a button, right? How do you do it? Yeah, it's, um, it's basically all gravity feed. So the wing has a slight angle to it called dihedral. So the tips of the wings are higher than the, say the root or the center of the wing. So uh, mm -hmm. it naturally gravity feeds down into the center of the wing. And then uh, there's a central tank that it feeds into with check valve. So uh, it can flow in, but it can't flow back out. And then the engine pulls fuel from that central tank. So there's no uh, button or uh, valves or anything, any um, input required from the pilot to manage that. It's all passive, uh, basically. And then, um, yeah, if you're in any kind of uh, banked turn or uncoordinated flight where you have a tendency for fuel to slosh, it's uh, that central sump maintains a kind of a minimum quantity of fuel for the engine to always uh, burn. So it, provided that you don't fly in a uncoordinated position for too long, uh, there's no issue where you're going to encounter fuel starvation. Yeah, that would, the, the position he's talking about is like if you flew upside down for more than a minute, which we don't imagine most pilots doing. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it, yeah, it's not a, it's not an aerobatic aircraft per se. It's, it's made for just, uh, you get in and cruise for a long time, um, yeah. but you kind of have to design for uh, all sorts of edge cases. So that's the idea there. It's a kind of an added safety factor. Mm, and you're t trying to take the human as a parameter as much out of the equation as possible, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, if you look at um, failure data or uh, accident data for plane crashes and the root cause of that, uh, very frequently there's pilot error as the cause of the crash. So anything you can do to I guess, eliminate the pilot from the equation as much as possible or automate things or make them passive uh, has a good chance of improving your safety. Yeah, it makes absolute sense. Talking about the fuel again, can you explain the difference between max cruise and the economy cruise for the audience? Like yeah. What's, what's the difference? Um, and uh, maybe I can also show if you're like a visual learner, the graph that you put on your website. Yeah, so we have um, different ways you can operate the aircraft depending on how fast or how far you want to fly or what your fuel budget is. So uh, if, you, if your pure goal is I want to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible, you'd fly at a maximum cruise condition, which is a little bit lower altitude, a little bit higher power setting and higher fuel burn. And uh, yeah, that's going to get you the max speed, maximum speed. But if your goal is uh, maybe burning a little bit less fuel or you have a really long range flight where say you're flying over a long expanse of water or you're just trying to get from one side of the country to the other and I don't want to have to stop for fuel, uh, then you mm -hmm. can fly at a more economy cruise setting which uh, is better miles per gallon and lower fuel burn rate and it's going to give you longer total range on the aircraft. So that 
that's a better way to operate in a scenario where if you have a really long flight where flying faster might cause you to uh, burn up your fuel and have to land and refuel. So it's actually for a really long flight faster to fly slower, if that makes sense. I see. Okay, okay. Obviously, your plane comes um, as a kit. Can you talk about the price and how this kit actually comes if you order it? Uh, yeah, so what we're thinking of for the kit, so right now baseline price is uh, 80,000 USD and that includes all the airframe structures, so the wing, the tail, the, the tail structures, the fuselage, the canopy, the landing gear, it's essentially everything but your engine avionics uh, and paint and then your upholstery for your, your cockpit, however the pilot chooses to configure that. Um, so mm -hmm. as far as how the kit shows up, uh, we're thinking of doing two main kits. You'd have your fuselage kit and then you'd have your wing kit. And your fuselage kit would include uh, your fuselage, your landing gear components, everything you'd uh, kind of assemble within the fuselage realm. And then your wing kit would be your wing and then your other flying surfaces, your horizontal and vertical tail. Um, so there's some... It's, it's different in the sense of a traditional composite kit where you're actually doing layups and you're, you're mixing different epoxies. Our kit, uh, we've already done all that work and the main structures are kind of bonded together. Um, the builder, him or herself, is more just bolting and bonding components together. So once I order, for instance, a kit from you, I have to assemble it by myself. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, you so I guess it depends on how. Or, yeah, I mean, as long as like for for FAA regulations on um, for kit aircraft, uh, the builder. So we're we're only legal able able to build uh, forty nine percent up yes. to forty nine percent mm -hmm. of the kit's construction. So we're mm -hmm. essentially a parts manufacturer, and you as a customer are responsible for the final build and putting it together into a full aircraft, but. Um, what we've always strived for is to make it uh, as easy to build as possible and take uh, the stuff that people traditionally find frustrating, especially about composite kits, out of the equation. So um, in composite kits, a lot of times people get stuck spending a lot of that time not actually building and constructing, but actually just sanding and doing um, things to kind of get their parts to meet the final geometry so that things match up. But because all of our molds and tooling were uh, done on a pretty high degree of precision uh, through CNC um, tooling, machining, um, we, we've had just like, we've, we've, the whole time we've been doing this, we've had to like really strive to like dial in all these things to have really good tolerances and make sure our parts fit up because we, we didn't want our builders uh, stuck with the task of trying to um, I guess, make up for our mistakes in our tooling. So, um, it, you know, it seems, it seems like something that seems, I guess to me, this seems just like a no brainer that you do this as a company to provide these things to your customers. But there are other, uh, composite kits that have been on the market in the past that, um, didn't give their customers that kind of benefit. Um, and they were, um, just yeah, harder to build, harder to build. Yeah. Um, yeah, so our, our goal all along, you know, we've always wanted, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, what, what would I want to see in a kit build? Like, what kind of stuff do I hate working on? Um, like, for instance, Riley was building um, a composite kit uh, of a canard design, the Cozy Mark IV. And that one's probably a more of a worst case where you're getting a set of plans and then you're building all the jigs and fixtures, all the, you know, yeah, that one's not, it's not even a kit. It's a, it's called a plans built. Yeah. Basically. You just start with a set of instructions and raw materials and literally build everything. So going from there, it's like, okay, what can we do to eliminate all the, like there's so much work that goes into it that has nothing to do with even building a plane. You're building like, the, you know, you're duplicating all this work that all the other customers that are building this plane are doing. So, um, yeah, and our, we, we kind of envisioned it in simple, kind of layman terms is we played with Legos a lot as kids and you get a Lego kit and it has all the pieces that you need to um, stack together and then you have this final uh, product really. Right. Or like an Ikea furniture set, you don't have to build the screwdriver to make the Ikea set, right? You just start putting stuff together. So that was kind of the same 
concept that we wanted to carry over to the aircraft itself is we wanted these beautiful carbon fiber parts to arrive and then your you know day two or day three you've already got you know some things that have materialized that look like a plane and right we thought would be really exciting and really rewarding for our customers to right. be proud of and to put together that, that's the big thing too is like riley would be building this cozy and he'd spend so much time sanding that uh Keegan and i would come out there and it was almost like you know, it would be a week later and the plane looked about the same, but we knew he was out there the whole time. We were like, well, what are you doing out here? Yeah. You know, you're putting all these hours in. Well, but like, that, that's a worst case scenario. And that, the idea of uh, a kit that goes together quickly is not new. There are other kit aircraft right. out there that are quick to put together, but uh, traditionally a composite kit aircraft or one made out of carbon fiber or fiberglass, those traditionally require uh, a lot more work. And it's a, a pretty common a uh, message you'll hear from people in aviation is they're scared of building a composite kit aircraft. Like a, a lot of people want to build them because they they look nice and they have good performance, but there's uh, a big mountain to climb as far as the build experience. So we were trying to uh, kind of approach that, that Lego set type uh, build experience as much as possible. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Got it. Okay, cool. But what, in terms of like building the airplane in the early phases and the late phases, what were the bi biggest bottlenecks you, you faced? What would you say? There's lots. <laughs> um, no, I, yeah. I think um, like one that always comes to mind early on, so that we, uh, with our hollow grid uh, structure, uh, that's really dependent on having good uh, honeycomb sandwich panel structures. Uh, and we, we initially wanted to just buy some off-the-shelf panels and they're out there you can buy them but they're either uh, really expensive if you want a custom one or if you buy a standard panel uh, we couldn't find any that were really going to meet our standards or were compatible with our structure that we wanted to build so we ended up uh, trying to figure out how to build our own and it took us a long time to to finally dial that in. It's easy to make uh, just a little one foot by one foot test panel. We figured that out pretty quickly, but then scaling that up to say a four foot by eight foot sheet and then having that repeatable and having it um, consistent, across consistent that and, and you know meeting our weight specs and everything. That was the really challenging thing is how do we do this at scale? Right. And we spent a, like probably a year figuring that out. Um, so that was a big hurdle. It's. Um, uh, it's something where when we were moonlighting this and we were doing it back in the early days and we decided to go down the hollow grid path and make the panels, we were like, all right, we're good to go. We made a one foot by one foot. We'll just scale this up to four feet by eight feet and we'll just replicate what we did on a small scale. But it turns out, uh, and we're not going to provide all the information on how we did it, but it just didn't scale yeah. on the small scale. It didn't scale up to a larger, um, a larger panel. So, uh, you know, we had made these assumptions that that part of the build was already solved in our mind. But once we went in full time, it was something that we had to kind of dial in and basically relearn and revisit I how to approach it. We budgeted like a couple of weeks for so we had a set of challenges on our marker board. And then like making a large flat panel was like had a time budget of like two weeks. And when it was more like it was like a checkbox item. Yeah, it was something that took like months but it and turned, months. It turned into like a full and blown R&D project. Yeah, where all three of us were trying to solve it because that was like, I, you know, if we can't get that figured out, that's like a pretty essential thing for like the rest of the kit. So until we could figure that out, we couldn't progress to like these other challenges. Yeah. Um, uh, another one that comes to mind is just building a good production quality mold. So everything like yeah. the airframe you see behind us is um, that's all uh, built in molds. And uh, when we started out, um, we had to learn to build a mold. And I, you know, I, like you said, we've been building a composite aircraft before this and all the techniques and everything I learned in that uh, kind of had to throw out the window and learn again, because uh, with, the, with the goals that we had for performance and quality and weight, uh, kind of had to start over basically. So we, we built a set of molds for like the tail was the first structure we built, the horizontal stabilizer. And we built a whole set of molds, plugs, and the tail itself and uh, got through all that and learned a bunch in the process and then <laughs> realized that we just needed to start over. And like we, uh, so we threw all those molds away um, and started from scratch and with the lessons learned from those and then carried all that forward. So then 
Uh, but that probably, I don't know, that was probably like a six month ordeal going through and building all those yeah. and, um, and starting over. But I mean, there's a lot of good things we learned in that. Um, so I don't know if you call it a bottleneck as much as just part of the R&D and learning process. Part of what makes it challenging as well is a lot of what we're trying to do, the information isn't readily available right. out there. So if you're looking to solve a problem, you can't do a Google search for mm. how to solve this problem. It's kind of, and you know, the textbooks may not uh, have the the right information that aligns yeah. with your yeah, you there's know, like, goals. There's, there's like high level information, but yeah. then you'll get into a scenario where you have like a, a specific unknown uh, and there's it's not yeah you can't just google it. you kind of have to just uh try different things until you figure it out hmm. i think a lot of people would be interested in how much of your studies did you actually use so far by in building that plane what would you say yeah i mean i was gonna mention this too if in terms of building a mold but like you take a there's a composites course that uw offers but there's nowhere in there about like okay here's the class on how to build a giant mold like they'll give you like the high level overview of composites and let you sort yeah. of get exposed to it but yeah it, uh, to your question but like how much you're using like you use you the, uh, so much of like the theoretical foundation that you learn um, you know with like heat transfer or you know your structures course or circuits like you use all that but then um, I think you know there's there's kind of a gap uh, with like the hands on stuff that um Yeah. A lot of this is mm -hmm. so. I mean, this is so heavily manufacturing based that, um, and you know, some of the stuff we're, we're literally developing the manufacturing procedure for it. So that's kind of the unknown uh, or the uncharted territory. Yeah. I, guess. I mean, like uh, these guys probably had more experience designing stuff in CAD through their degrees, but um, I think they can attest to uh, the difference between designing something in CAD for school and thinking you have something that's manufacturable. And then when you have to actually manufacture it, like your your whole mindset has to change about how you design the thing and make sure that that part can be made. And especially for us where I think we've sort of hinted at this, um, but along the way of building this thing, the, the Dark Arrow One, the other thing in the back of our heads is how do you build the process to scale building that multiple times? And that's like a, its own set of challenges on top of building the aircraft itself. Um, so everything is done in that context of like, can this be done not just for the prototype, but for any number of kits we build from here on out. And to mm -hmm. add on that, what makes that challenging um, and different from like, say, an automotive company where they're shipping out or delivering out a final end product, uh, we have to solve a problem of how do we manufacture this uh, at scale, scale being, you know, tens of kits, tens to you know, 30 to 60 kits per year, but then also produce it in a way that uh, someone in their garage can assemble the rest of it. So right. we're solving like two separate problems. One, to make it manufacturable on our end, but then also make it manufacturable for the layman right. on the other end. It's yeah. almost like they, it's like you have almost like a fully, you almost have like this process that's like a fully built certified aircraft, but the we do our end and then we're handing it off to this other manufacturer who's our, also our customer. And you have to assume that their knowledge on this thing, it's like if you're handing it off to a third party manufacturer and they don't have any notion of like design standards or like, um, you know, these, these things that you have in industry to communicate how things are built. Um, you have to like really make it simple. for Yeah. Them. It's all, yeah. It's, it's like this weird, manufacturing process that's kind of unique to kit aircraft where um yeah you're it's yeah the, there's not a lot of other <laughs> manufacturing environments like that i guess the closest other thing there's like kit cars you can right. do uh which would be a similar scenario but uh yeah that, that's kind of what makes it so hard is we're not just building a plane or just building a prototype like if we were just building one of these it would actually be so much easier but right. because we have to constantly be thinking about uh is this something that a uh, customer could build? You know, someone who has mm -hmm. very minimal mechanical skills or is not very good with hands-on, like, yeah. I know I can do this, but can anyone do this? Um, and also like, can we make these parts uh, cost-effective? Can we do this repeatedly? Um, just keeping all those things in mind for doing more than just one. And there's, there's lots of times where, uh, 
you know, I, I, I manufacturing something or uh, like hooking up the engine I'm working on or working through kind of right now. Um, there's lots of ways to do it and that I could get away with, but uh, mm -hmm. I could never recommend a customer do that. Right. Um, if it was just us and just our lives depending on this, it would, it would be different. But um, when other people's lives are coming into it, uh, really have a sense of responsibility, I guess, to get everything uh, basically perfect. <laughs> so that's, mm -hmm. what, that's what the big challenge is with the design and manufacturing. Uh, I get it. Yeah, it's just something like uh, terms and conditions a uh, customer would have to sign, quote unquote, because I mean, you could push it to the edge, right? Like tweak the engine a bit and uh, do stuff yourself. People do do that. That's kind of uh, a part of the aspect of the uh, the home built aviation industry. Um, you can, it is a little bit like the Wild West. You can do anything you, with that you want because it's your airplane. And um, so p people do modify their aircraft and they, you know, they do tweak engines and like, we can't stop them from doing that. But we, yeah. we definitely have our recommendation for like, this is, this is a configuration that's going to give you the best results. And we're building the airplane for, you know, efficient cross country cruising. Um, and people might have different ideas in mind. Yeah. And that's, that's just the nature of the industry. But we, um, obviously we think the airplane is best at what we designed it for. And we're always mm -hmm. going to uh, recommend that. Like uh, also going back to the beginning where we said that you put all your heart and effort into this project of Dark Arrow One and the company and building a plane in, sp uh, in particular, do you think that's like you wanting to have freedom, like going for the stars? Like a bit of a philosophical question. Maybe you can answer that as well. Uh, yeah, I know it's, um, that's definitely something I think that was an early um, sort of, underlying tone to the company was that the plane represented that sort of freedom. Um, and that, you know, we, we kind of imagined like any of us, like, um, buying this plane, if we were the end customer and, you know, uh, we could imagine, you know, getting this thing and then building it and just the whole process of building, it could be this exciting journey. You go on to like create this thing that somehow, and you know, it's enabling you to travel to these places that you were only imagining in your head. And now like you're accessing them, um, through this thing you've built, um, it's, it's, you know, we wanted it to be kind of a rewarding experience and sort of, uh, be, be kind of like a, I don't know, like, um, kind of this endeavor you go down and in the end you, yeah, I, I think freedom is like a big theme with our plane and company. Yeah, I would mm -hmm. agree with that. And like, uh, that's, that's a conversation that we have pretty frequently is the, you know, the trips that we imagine taking and the adventures that we imagine embarking upon and, you know, our, our own aircraft when we get this thing up and going. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's really exciting. And the whole idea of building an aircraft in your, in your garage and then being able to fly across the country. And it is, uh, there's a lot of people that don't know that you can even do that, that building your own plane is a thing. And so that's another aspect of this is that we want to, um, Bring that to a broader audience and let people know that like this is a potential thing that you can do with your time and money and uh you know you think like 200 years ago if you wanted to cross the country you basically had to do it on horseback and a covered wagon and it might mm. take you a year and you now might yeah you, you might, might die. die there might be children born along the way i don't know uh mm. but now it's something you can do in a day or that's the goal with this is you could you know cross the whole country in a in a day in a machine that you built in your garage and so that's um that's cool to us mm, excellent and a question i also like to ask my podcast guest is so what's your spirit animal what would you say also taking into account that you built that you build a plane. What's your, what do you think? What's your spirit animal? I feel like it has to be some sort of bird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Sort of like really uh, aggressive bird of prey, like an eagle or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, what I thought of. Yeah, that was my first like thought, like an eagle. Uh, mm -hmm. Not a pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> Not, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, coming to, ooh, do we have any competitors? Like also building like, the same like small plane? Uh, yeah, I think you could argue that we have quite a few competitors in different ways. Uh, so we're not, you know, we're not the first mm -hmm. company to build a kit aircraft. This concept, I mean, you think yeah. about it, the Wright brothers were building airplanes in their garage uh, over 100 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. So this 
has been around a long time. Um, but like the obvious big players in the market, Vans Aircraft is a well-known name. We don't necessarily see them as a uh, direct competitor. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. I don't know. But um, they build a riveted this- aluminum airplane rather than our composite. Um, but they they have mm-hmm. like 10,000 planes flying right now. So they're, they're a big player in the market that we kind of look up to. Um, and there are other... Uh, Glass Air and Lance Air are two other companies that were historically making high performance, high speed aircraft. Um, yeah, but everyone we talk to, a lot of our customers, everyone has uh, ambitions to own like three or four airplanes. So just because uh, there are other players in the market doesn't mean that um, we're necessarily competitors. But, you know, people argue like, I need a, a sailplane or like a glider, I need a high speed one, I need a yeah, a four-person family airplane. I need an ultralight. So it's, it's interesting too because we have a number of customers that have already built planes that they own, and they want to just build a composite plane. Um, so it's not like because they already own a plane that they would be uh, already, you know, like you know, filtered out from our customer base. Um, yeah. People, some of these people, they get they get into the habit of building planes, and they just like the process and want something new. Yeah, I think that's kind of a like a misconception that we've heard, I guess, from the business end of it is that uh, people can only pick one or the other for airplanes. And that's that's true for many people. They only have the budget to build one airplane. But there's a lot of people we talk to that's like, you know, I built this plane, or I built that plane, I, I built five planes and I'm looking for my next project. They're serial builders and they just keep building planes because it's their hobby and it's their passion. It's what they like to do. So that's true for a a lot of uh, our customers. Mm, okay. What I would say is that we maybe jump over to some of the questions people asked us on social media. Siddha Shavara asked, how do I get a job in your company? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, we, uh, we actually get a lot of uh, interest or inquiries about working with us. And right now we're just a small team because we're building the prototype. So uh, yeah. kind of limited availability, but we um, are planning to ramp up into production once we get through flight testing. So uh, if you want to, you can send a resume to info at darkarrow.com and uh, we'll get you in the mix. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. Um, William Hibbert uh, from LinkedIn asked, who is also a potential customer, by the way, I noticed you use Onshape for geometric definition along with a carbon composite structure. How was the structure analysis, dynamic and flutter analysis performed? That would be the first one. That's one question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was one yeah. question. <laughs> so we use a whole bunch of different tools to perform uh, all sorts of different analysis, whether it's structural or uh, flight dynamics. Um, so like for structures, anything that's a uh, metallic structure, like the landing gear, we use FEA or the simulation to um, just simulate loads along with just simple hand calcs. You can get a long ways with that. Um, and, and then physical drop. Yeah, physical testing uh, for the composite structures. There's a lot. Um, it's a lot more difficult to do the analysis just on paper, um, and you can do uh, kind of high level like that. But the thing with composites is there's so many variables in the process. Whether you know your resin type, what type of cloth you're using for your carbon fiber, your cure temperature, your manufacturing procedure, uh, whether you, you vacuum up. bag it or wet lay up or infuse it, mm. three preg. All these variables feed into the mechanical properties. So uh, you can't just pull a number out of a textbook. And what we had to do is we spent a long time doing uh, mechanical testing on samples. So we would make samples that were manufactured to our procedure and our standard Process. with our materials. Yeah. And then we would test them and get numbers from those. And then it was kind of an iterative process using that test data we got would feed into our structure. And then we'd build a little bit bigger structure and test that and work our way up. Um, so yeah, a combination of tools and testing is uh, how we did all the, mm. the structure stuff. Yeah. Great. Uh, the sec- second question from William was, uh, what was the trade of study in the application of winglets for your design? CFD performance improvement study for winglets. Yeah, I can cover that one too. Uh, that, uh, we get a lot of <laughs> questions about winglets and I'm thinking about making a video specifically about that because we get that question so much. But um, mm-hmm. the trade off is that, um, you, you install a winglet um, 
to reduce induced drag. So for our mission where it's high speed cruise, long range, we found that um, where we were at, the induced drag at our design point was actually pretty low. It's a very low percentage of the total drag. So adding mm -hmm. um, a winglet, while it re uh, reduced the induced drag, which is the drag uh, as a byproduct of producing lift, um, when you install that winglet, it reduces the induced drag, but it ends up increasing the parasitic drag by a pretty similar increment. So there wasn't a significant benefit to it. Uh, but if our mission was different and we were flying at say a higher altitude at slower speed, um, there would be maybe more benefit to uh, installing a winglet. But so our, our winglet, our wing looks really simple. It's just a pretty square or relatively square wing tip. Um, and it's very simple to manufacture and ends up for our design point, uh, ends up being a relatively efficient design. Mm -hmm. Got it. Then Adrian Pohoika is also asking something about simulation. So great project. I wonder what is the overall scope of engineering analysis, for instance, static, dynamic, NVH, and so on. And are you also using analysis with topological modeling to reduce weight maintaining other parameters? Uh, so we did kind of touch on the static and dynamic analysis there, I think, yeah. earlier. But then right. something interesting he mentioned was the uh, topology optimization. And we have been dabbling mm -hmm. that a little bit. Uh, Keen, I know you did some with your engine mount. If you want to yeah we've played with uh like depending on what tools or what engineering tools you're using they have different um terminology for it but it's basically optimizing your part uh specifically around the loads or the stresses that it will see um so you basically there's different ways to to goal seek for but the traditional one is reducing the amount of weight as much as possible but still maintaining strength so you basically tell your computer simulation, here are the loads, the different load cases on my part. Um, go and figure out different designs that will um, reduce the weight as much as possible, but still maintain strength. So you'll get these really weird organic types of geometries that'll be able to take those loads. But then you, the tricky part is trying to narrow down, a, narrow down something that you still man, manufacture um, and make repeatedly. So we've played with that some with different components and we've gotten some interesting results, uh, but ultimately we don't have parts that lend themselves well um, to topology where we've had to optimize to that point. So. Yeah, we, yeah, we've definitely looked into another uh, example. Uh, we've been working with the uh, Palmer Engineering Center at University of Wisconsin-Madison and one of uh, the guys we're working with, his uh, research is specifically on uh, Topology. Topology optimized uh, inserts in honeycomb panel uh, structures. So like if you were going to bolt into a honeycomb sandwich panel, uh, the, the hard point or the insert where you bolt into, there's a bunch of different ways you could build that. And he had a lot of uh, designs. And so uh, we were actually working with him to test a bunch of that out. Uh, we haven't implemented any of it yet, but um, yeah, there's... We got to save something for version two. <laughs> yeah, there's some topology optimization. Well, and there's, there's a big balance to strike too, because we can come up with some really crazy designs and that involve, you know, 3D printed metal and uh, other structures, but um, there's a manufacturability thing to balance out there and, um, and, yeah, cost. and cost. And so there, there's always striking that balance and we're, uh, we're always looking for like the best tools and materials and optimizing everything but while still trying to balance all these other requirements of, uh, yeah, can we, can we manufacture this? Um, you know, is the, is this technology thoroughly vetted? Like, can we throw this in an aircraft and feel, right. you know, we can bet our lives on it. So, um, yeah, yeah lots, lots of things to weigh out with that. So going to the next question from Megan Jenkins, how did you incorporate SimScale into your workflow? Uh, we actually have a video that we just released about this, uh, <laughs> talking about uh, one example we used uh, SimScale for designing the wing and um, trying to optimize it for having uh, favorable stall properties so that the handling is, uh, is good when the aircraft is nearing its stall. Um, but we used it uh, a number of other areas and we're actually planning a couple more videos talking about that. But um, yeah, basically uh, SimScale's simulation tool we use for uh, simulating aerodynamics on the aircraft and um, mm -hmm. yeah, really useful for us actually. Perfect. Uh, 
Choc Drago is asking who is going to be the test pilot. <laughs> no. Uh, no, we have a couple of test pilots that we've been talking to, and this is like they do this professionally, um, and they're mm. the kind of people that you'd want, especially on a plane that's like high speed, long range, or high speed. I guess is the big thing there is that um, yeah, you want someone that can uh, react quickly and has experience, uh, you know, and kind of toes this line between being an engineer and being kind of like a cowboy of sorts. Uh, you say it like cowboy, they're going <laughs> to... No, like, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of a better word for it, but uh, there's someone that... There's a, like, there's a motor skill aspect to it, basically. Yeah. Like, we, uh, they have many, many flight hours. And right. been through many, many different scenarios that would allow them to react and uh, kind of yeah. deal with situations that come up that may not be expected. So right. we're not in a good position to be that... Uh, that person. Yeah, there's that. a specific skill set to being a pilot, yeah. and they do this for a living. And um, you have very specific procedures and protocols you do for every flight. And um, you know, we, yeah. The other thing uh, to mention with that is that we want uh, a third party or you know someone other than us to uh, be able to kind of flight test it and give their feedback because uh, I guess building confidence in our product for customers to show that we're not uh, just making stuff up kind of thing. Yeah. All humidity would like to know and would love to hear about the group's work experience leading up to this project. Uh, so I guess we mentioned that a little bit in our intros, but I don't think, or maybe we could say something interesting from our work background that we carried into this. Maybe? Sure. Um, Yeah, so I kind of briefly mentioned this, but just um, I was working for a couple companies in town. Uh, the last one I was working for for a few years was a medical device company known as Propeller Health. Um, they make sensors for asthma inhalers, uh, and I was designing kind of the software for um, the like, data feed from that. So we were pulling all this data from all these different sensors and having to relay that to clinicians and patients and people that wanted to keep tabs on uh, their loved ones that were asthma inhaler users. Um, kind of a far cry from what I'm doing now, but uh, you know, um, the experience I learned there through like uh, developing software and uh, kind of feeding that into like my background as uh, an electrical engineer with a focus on control systems. Uh, kind of translated well to certain aspects at this company where uh, Ray and Keegan don't necessarily have those backgrounds. Uh, so there's there's sort of this unique role that I could play um, on uh, different challenges we've run into, um, building our equipment and stuff like that that needs to be computer controlled. And there's, um, you know. Like the oven would be a big one. The oven, yeah, we built our own oven at one point and uh, all that needed to have a very good um, kind of tight feedback loop for having good ramp cycles and things like that to make it more efficient and then designing the vacuum former. I had some experience uh, for a while working for a thermoforming company that, uh, it, you know, it was, it was brief enough where, um, you know, I wouldn't say that it was like I got all the experience I needed to do something like that, but uh, because I had more than zero experience, that became my expertise. Um, Day one, he was a thermoforming expert. In yeah, the so I mean, there's, there's, we all, have, I would say, different things that um, gave us a good foundation. But obviously, it's not until you get into the thick of it that you really like, like the so many of the problems we've run into here. I don't know how you could get the experience anywhere else except to just do it um, and kind of figure it out. You just have to be willing to adapt, and I think we're all pretty good at doing that. Um, that, that was sort of a long-winded answer from my end, but that was good. <laughs> you guys, you guys. That was a great answer, though. For me, my kind of prior work experience, I, w I was working on something completely different than aircraft. I was working on, uh, they're called after-treatment systems. They're basically big catalytic converters for Class 8 trucks. So semis you see going down the road, they have to have a way to clean their exhaust. So I was a, like a project engineering lead our project engineer on those. So basically taking the product from an early kind of concept stage out through production. So 
Uh, we did a lot of things like uh, doing the testing, doing the validating, um, and then integrating it with customer vehicles, and then you know bringing it from out of the concept stage and into final production was kind of where I spent a lot of my time and focus. So knowing that process is definitely something that has helped kind of carry into this. And then getting mm -hmm. a feel for the manufacturing, like building things at scale and the type of bottlenecks you can run into and the issues you can run into if things aren't designed correctly is another thing that I've been able to kind of incorporate uh, related to this. So, so um, we can move on to the next question from Martin Alves, who asks, if you could own any plane, what would it be? Mm. This is a good one. I was thinking like the stealth bomber for me. For me. <laughs> That's a nice one. Yeah, I, I guess I, or my first thought was, yeah, is it any plane? Can ever? it be like a fictional plane? Because the Millennium <laughs> Falcon would be pretty cool. Yeah. Is that count as a plane though? I don't know. <laughs> Millennium Falcon, B2. I was, for, gonna, I was gonna say SR-71. Yeah. Um, Blackbird would be pretty I, cool. I think like, okay, so like going to the Millennium Falcon comparison, I think that would be the ideal. Like if, if we could, you know, have more resources and more time, I guess, to develop another aircraft. Um, like say we had, you know, this is like talking like way down the road, but if, you know, if you could develop something that, that does all the same things you do with this plane, but allows you to take more people and more cargo, I think that would be pretty awesome. I think that's why anyone likes private jets is it's like kind of like a flying motorhome of sorts. You know, you're you start taking that experience of like uh, road tripping, but on a global scale. And uh, so what you're saying is your dream plan would be the next Dark Arrow? Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Like I, I would say that's, that's the next realm I would be interested in. Like this is cool because it's sort of, um, you know, you can take a, it, it's, it's part of the, the most capable plane we could like reasonably do with the resources we have. Yeah. Um, but take if, it to if, another level. Again, that's why I prefaced it by saying if we had like, you know, an infinite budget or something relatively. Yeah. So like, yeah, that, that would be my dream plane is something where I'm taking like the experience of an RV and translating it to something that's high speed, long range. Okay. Okay. We have a next question coming from Alex Maisonov, which is very interesting. What will be the takeoff and landing distance? Uh, takeoff and landing distance are, um, we don't have hard numbers for them yet, um, but mm -hmm. projecting around a thousand feet takeoff and landing roll. And that's heavily dependent mm -hmm. on the propeller we end up pairing with the engine. And uh, we have kind of a unique combination of the engine and propeller. Um, so it's, I'm sorry, the engine and the airframe. So there, there's not like an off the shelf propeller that is perfectly optimized for what we have. So we uh, ant anticipate we might need to iterate that on that some. So uh, we don't have firm numbers, but once we get through flight testing, obviously we'll have a more concrete number than the thousand feet take mm -hmm. control. Yeah. I think a question that gets asked a lot and what's also asked by Matt Sprun is, how are you guys financed? We are self-funded. Uh, so, yeah. you know, we all mentioned our industry experience. We all uh, worked at different companies doing engineering jobs for a while before this. So we essentially saved up money and um, poured it into this. And then along the way, we've been uh, creative and basically found ways to keep our costs low so that um, we've got a relatively long runway with the, the money that we had. Yeah. And uh, we... Mm -hmm. It would be fun to have uh, like a, a Bill Gates type guy just write us a check, uh, you know, as an investor and say, have at it, guys. Uh, but uh, we, we, we wanted to keep things among us three so that we weren't uh, swayed from our intended mission. Because anytime yeah. you bring investors into the fold, they have their own idea for what direction they want to yeah. take things that you need to balance. And that's been a, um, a frequent story in new aircraft companies is uh, kind of balancing that and... Um, between the, the aircraft guys and the investor guys. And that that's a big challenge. So yeah, uh, it's just us mm -hmm. three though. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, also very interesting question from Dano Jung. What systems on your airplane are redundant? Um, yeah, I mean, I can kind of speak to that because uh, a lot of times I think this references sort of your avionics system. Uh, that's where I think there's the most complexity, but yeah, there's 
pretty much everything in that realm is redundant. Um, we often say that I think pretty much everything on the plane is redundant outside of the engine. Yeah, you only have um, one engine, but then the systems that support the engine are yeah. redundant. So there's two fuel pumps, two ignition systems, yeah, two computers. Two, yeah. um, you pretty much have two of everything for all the critical, like flight critical. Yeah, and then um, like your flight display, avionics, uh, there's essentially two versions of that. Um, yeah. And then Which, like the landing gear even has a backup if the the system to extend and retract the landing gear fails. There's a backup for that. Yeah. And we've, we've tried to do a good job of like looking at like what are, you know, kind of strike this balance between what's most likely to happen. And if that does happen, how bad is it for, you know, is the plane going to fall out of the sky if this fails? So you have to, you, you, it's not as simple as just saying we're going to make everything redundant because at some point, you know, if you have too much redundancy, you can end up making the system more complicated, which could end up making it harder to service. Um, lead to more failures uh, later or like, you know, if someone's wiring it up wrong, especially in, in the context of this where we're handing it off to builders and they're having to build it, you know, you don't want to overcomplicate the build process of it where they're wiring things up wrong or, you know, they have a million switches. They got to, like, once they go into like their failure mode, they got to start, they have a checklist that's like a mile long that they're having to like, flip in all these redundant things we we try to yeah just strike a good balance with like the redundancy and trying to make sure that things that fail or if they do fail um there's less pilot workload involved in like making sure those systems are ready to go um in an emergency mm -hmm. they're, they're doing a lot of these checks uh on the ground before they take off um but yeah i mean in a plane it's it's different than a car where like if you have car trouble uh you can just pull off to the side but uh, in a plane it's like you know if you have you know, engine trouble, you know, your, your life is potentially on the line. So we're, we're definitely aware of, uh, you know, those sort of safety aspects and trying to make sure that we're not um, only optimizing for performance. Yeah. Mm. Got it. Okay, cool. Brian asks, uh, what has been the most te technical challenging aspect of the build? Uh, we mentioned the uh, panels before that was a big hurdle. The yeah. canopy manufacturing mm -hmm. has been difficult. Yeah. Um, another thing I think is just um, trying to squeeze so much out of an aircraft. So we're shooting for a pretty high level of performance and efficiency and range. And um, so part of that has meant uh, trying to kind of minimize the airframe structure around a normal size cockpit. And so we've kind of squeezed a lot of uh, hardware and accessories into this aircraft. So it's kind of a, a packaging challenge, I guess you would say, or a, it's like playing yeah. Tetris with all the components that you have to fit in there. And I'm a, mm -hmm. given my background with manufacturing stuff, I don't, I'm probably a little bit biased on this, but there, there, there's a difference between designing um, something for one-off versus designing something for repeating and making that over and over again. And I know we touched on this earlier, but I think it's a huge technical challenge trying to design something that you can make over and over again versus yeah. one-off. If we were making this plane for ourselves and making it, you know, no intentions of making it again, I think we'd be done with it by yeah. now or we'd have it completed and flying. But that's kind of the big technical challenge is how do we make this not just for ourselves one time, but make it many times and make it the same each time every time yeah. you make it. And then on top of that, it's the fact that it needs to be optimized for performance. So it's 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 pretty easy to come up with a potential solution to a design problem. But then the question is, you know, how, how much is this solution optimized? And if you're not concerned about weight or cost or manufacturability, you just throw it out the window and like, I just need one, that's easy. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, when you try to, you're trying to do better that, than everything that came before you. That's that's what that's hard. So yeah. that's a mm -hmm. big challenge. Yeah. What I would like to know is uh, you are three brothers and uh, everyone has his own expertise. So are there some scenarios where you like um, like arguing over each other? Like, okay, my solution is better than yours. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> I'd say for the non-technical stuff, that's where I'd say more debates are opened up because uh, there's some things that just don't have, uh, there's not one answer that's right. So then it becomes mm -hmm. more like who's who's done more, who's more emotionally invested. Yeah, who's going to get more upset <laughs> if the change is made? I don't know, like, like we're not talking about like, 
like for the technical stuff, you know, when we can prove it with math, I'd say there that's hard to like create debate yeah. because it's like, all right, the math is in your favor. So I can't really argue with that. But then if it's like, what color should this be? Or, you know, things where it's like, the, the plane's not gonna, it's not a flight critical thing. It's yeah. more just like. The, there's a good thing we have going on, the fact that there's three of us. So there's never really a tie on anything. It's usually <laughs> if like two guys are arguing about right. something, it's like, all right. Best you know, he can three. come over here and tell us which is best, and then that, that usually <laughs> settles it then because you got a majority vote. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, well, I had something else I wanted. To, I was Just don't have, that. don't have a company started with uh, even number of people. Yeah, can't be two or four, <laughs> three or five. Is fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Another thing is too like okay. everything you're designing. Um, you know, wherever you're working on, it kind of becomes your baby, and then uh, but you might get tunnel vision on it, and so then someone else peeks over your shoulder and is looking at what you designed is like you know hey why is that dimension like that or why <laughs> they're eating then, a sandwich and uh yeah. they point over your shoulder like yeah basically and then i don't know that that happens frequently where uh you know you throw a second set of eyes on something and uh kind of throws a wrench in the whole design so we we pretty frequently try to uh bounce ideas off each other hey come look at this does this make sense so that we catch things early on but yeah. it's always kind of interesting when something gets caught late in the game and it's like Oh, dang it. Now I got to like start over. Yeah. But, but we're, I think we're not afraid to like say how we feel and we, we trust each other enough where if we get into a fight, we know we can reconcile whatever happened in that. And uh, we know mm -hmm. our backgrounds pretty well. Uh, and we know like how to manage, uh, these sort of arguments that come up. I, I think that's good because if I'd say, if we were afraid to speak our mind, things might get designed wrong yeah. or, you might yeah. be like prioritizing someone's ego over or yeah, hurting not, their feelings. None of us are afraid to hurt each other's feelings. Yeah, so. right. That's that's a big thing. It's like you're you're always. I think we all kind of come together on the bigger mission of it all, and that sort of always unites us at the end of the day. Even if like in the moment you're like fully invested in this one aspect, and you can take it personally if someone's like going to challenge it. Um, you ultimately, you know, know that they're on the same team as you. So it uh, it never really is anything that like it's a it's we never really have arguments or fights that extend into the even like the next hour. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's never anything where we're mad at each other for more than just like yeah, it, uh, yeah it's never really personal. It'll be like we're arguing about some design aspect, and you'll be like pretty invested. And then five minutes later, we'll be like, hey, let's go get lunch. Yeah, okay, yeah. that sounds good. And that's the end of it, <laughs> right? So uh, also a question would be, how long do you work like every day? Is it like that you embrace the Elon Musk kind of working style or how do you approach this? Yeah. Was always working. Like last night, we, you and I were working yeah. on until like 10.30 it, or something. It ultimately depends on the day. Um, yeah. If we're really making some good progress, we'll just keep going. Like if I'm machining something and I know mm -hmm. it's got like a certain amount of time left and the it's past eight o'clock or whatever time it may be, I'll just keep going on it. Um, but yeah, we don't really have a set schedule. And that's one of the nice things is that uh, because we've got programs like SimScale and Onshape, you can work on it um, from home. And then if there's something you're working on at the shop, you just keep working on it. There's no one that's going to tell you mm -hmm. to go home. Yeah. It, it does get frustrating at times, I'd say, like, you know, when you work with other suppliers that they, you know they're on a nine to five schedule and then you try to plan out like, OK, I got to call them at this point because I know that they're probably not going to follow up until like three in the afternoon or, you know, maybe even the next day. So or if it's like Saturday, you forget, like you're going to call someone you're like, oh, yeah, they're they're not going to be working right now. Yeah. So trying to like manage like the relationships with other companies we source from. Um, is Although it's interesting. It's always getting you, more and more like in the modern day and age, everyone's kind of working more and more. So you do see like, you know, you get emails or suppliers talking to you on the weekends and stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, not, uh, one thing I wanted to mention with uh, working kind of crazy hours is we try to uh, be smart about it too. And like, we recognize, uh, you know, it's happened where you're working late on something and you're kind of mentally fried a little bit and you'll make mistakes. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. there'll be times where it's like physically you have the drive to go, but then, you know, mentally you might be thinking like, All right, you know, I'm, I'm distracted at this point or I'm tired and I, I could make a mistake. So we try to, uh, be smart about that and kind of know when to call it quits on something that's like 
critical that you don't want to mess up and yeah uh yeah so it's okay to keep working on other things but things that you know aren't going to kill you if you screw it up kind of thing kind mm -hmm. of thing yeah that's very smart yeah indeed um so to close so wrap everything up where can the audience find you how can we uh, support you Uh, we have a lot of different forms. Our website's a big one, www.darkhero.com. Uh, we also are pretty active on Instagram. And we've been trying to be uh, making some videos just showing our progress. So we've got our YouTube channel. It's just, if you just type in Dark Arrow, it uh, should come up. And then uh, as far as support goes, we obviously don't have the plane ready to ship out. But in the meantime, we have our merch store. We have a lot of cool hats and shirts and sweatshirts and stuff. So got sunglasses too. Sunglasses as well. And we're we've been adding new stuff uh, in between working on the plane. Yeah, like so. like our our sweatshirts we're wearing. So uh, yeah, we're gonna keep adding stuff. Um, it'll just yeah, there should be new things in there. Like I don't know, frequently, but. Yeah, we got, we, got, we got some other designs uh, that we're working on or thinking of that are a little bit more interesting than just our Dark Arrow logo. Uh, so, so those might be fun. So uh, yeah, it's just a, a nice little thing to support us with if you feel inclined to. But Yeah, that sounds great. Maybe you can uh, give the audience a discount code and then everybody can order something. Yes. Yeah, we'll have to put that together. Yeah. Uh, That's uh, great. Do that. Yep. Awesome, cool. Is there anything from your side you want to mention? Uh, yeah, definitely go check out our social media if you want to see more. We got a, we post pretty frequent updates uh, on our progress, and yeah, like Keegan mentioned, we've got videos. So yeah, check out our YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Yeah, and we're I don't know we're happy to get people in there and get the conversation going. Like Riley said earlier, uh, it's fun introducing people to the the concept of building your own aircraft and just the idea that you can have this freedom of yeah. flying far and flying, flying fast. And I think, you know, some of the best memories in the process of doing this is, uh, you know, connecting with different people and introducing them to this and connecting with different aviation enthusiasts, engineers, and other like-minded people that want to oh, try. No. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah, awesome. I mean, with with that, we can close the the, the podcast session. Thank you so much, guys, for participating. Uh, this was a great yeah. podcast and by far the longest one we had. So it's like <laughs> almost one and a half hours, which is great. Oh, wow. um, I put every link uh, to support you guys down in the comment section or and pin it. In in the meantime, we'll keep in touch via social media. Sounds okay. Good. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks a ton. Yeah. Thanks. Have a nice day, yeah. guys. Thanks.